Hey everyone! About a year ago, I released a video called All Electronic Components. It covered widely used parts, such as resistors, capacitors, diodes, transistors, etc. Today, we are going to discuss rare, even exotic devices that were not included in the first video. Their names are probably familiar to you, or maybe not. We'll see. This is Rob Martino. The first component we'll talk about today is called the thermistor or thermal resistor. A thermistor, as you might guess, is simply a resistor whose resistance changes depending on temperature. Thermistors are used in circuits where temperature affects operation, either the ambient temperature or the device's own temperature and hence needs to be monitored. I won't be wrong if I say that every one of you carries a device with this part in your pocket every day. Exactly. A mobile phone. The thermistor here measures the battery temperature. Let's do a quick experiment. Here's a regular smartphone battery. We measure the resistance between the negative and middle contact. 8.5K. Now let's warm it up by rubbing. Resistance drops to 7.7K. And here's a battery that's been sitting in the freezer. Its resistance is 15K. Obviously, there is a thermistor inside the battery. The schematic symbol for a thermistor is basically the resistor symbol with a little t and a diagonal line. Based on operation, these devices are divided into thermistors and positors. In a thermistor, the resistance drops when temperature rises. Exactly what we just saw. In a positor, resistance increases with temperature. So one has negative temperature dependence and the other has positive. Thermistors are labeled NTC, positors BTC. In datasheets, you may also see a minus T for thermistors and a plus T for positors right on the symbol. There's another neat use for thermistors. They are put in series with the mains input of power supplies to limit inrush current when the large input capacitor changes. For example, in this PSU, this green part here is a thermistor. The reed switch is a component with tiny contacts sealed inside a glass capsule. The capsule is filled with nitrogen or inert gas and the contacts change state in the presence of a magnetic field. So by bringing a magnet close, you can make it switch circuits. Reed switches come in three basic types. Normally open, normally closed, and changeover. In normally open, applying a magnet closes the circuit. In normally closed, it opens. Changeover combines both. Reed switches are commonly used as sensors in security and automation systems. For example, to trigger an alarm when a window or door is opened. Because the contacts are sealed, reed switches can work in dusty, humid, or aggressive environments. If you put the reed inside a coil and run current through it, you get a reed relay. Reeds last a long time because there's almost no friction between parts. But they do have disadvantages. Limited switching speed. They're not suitable as precision position sensors. They're affected by external magnetic fields, so they need shielding. They're fragile mechanically, no heavy vibration or shock. And eventually their contacts may stick together and fail to open. One major alternative is the whole effect sensor, which has no moving parts at all, and theoretically can last forever. I have a separate video on whole effect sensors, link in the description.
The varistor is a semiconductor device whose resistance drops sharply when the applied voltage exceeds a certain threshold. The name comes from various changing resistor. Varistors are used to protect circuit from voltage spikes and surge pulses. You can find them in almost any power supply, including ATX units. Let's look at this Chieftech GBA500S. The mains voltage goes through the power switch, fuse, choke, and common mode filters to the rectifier. And we can see the varistor placed across the mains, labeled Xeon R1. Its threshold is chosen so that normal mains voltage, usually up to 250 volts AC, won't trigger it. But if there is a spike above that, the varistor conducts sharply, shunting and dissipating the spike as heat. What happens if the mains voltage rises and stays high, for example because of a neutral brick? The varistor conducts a huge current and the fuse before it blows, thus protecting the rest of the PSU. In this power supply, instead of a varistor, there is a TVS diode, also called a transit suppressor, transil, or fire rector. It works kind of like a Zener diode. In forward direction, it's just a diode. In reverse direction, it conducts when voltage exceeds a certain threshold. But unlike Zeners, which increase current gradually, a TVS diode switches almost instantly and its internal resistance drops to almost zero. TDS diodes protect gear from voltage spikes just like varistors, but TVSs react faster. TVS diodes can also be bidirectional for AC lines or unidirectional like Zeners for DC only. In hard drives, you'll find low voltage suppressors, one on plus 5 volts rail, one on the plus 12 volts. The Stabister is another semiconductor device for voltage stabilization, kind of a distant relative of the Zener. Stabisters were mentioned in literature back in the 1960s, so they've been around for a while. They're also called Nermisters. A stabester is basically a diode used in forward direction, unlike Zeners, which are reverse. Its stabilization voltage is low, about 0.7 volts, same as the forward drop of a regular diode. The main difference is that a stabister has a precisely defined forward voltage. That's why it's often called a reference diode. You can connect two or three of them in series to get 0.4 volts or 2.1 volts. For that purpose, some stabisters are manufactured as multi-element stacks in a single package. Unlike Zeners, stabisters have a negative temperature coefficient, meaning at constant current, voltage drops as temperature rises. Zeners, on the contrary, have a positive coefficient. So stabisters and Zeners can be paired together to compensate for temperature in precision voltage regulators. That said, modern circuits usually use better options. For example, the TL441 shunt regulator, so stabisters aren't as common today. The Varica. The name literally translates to variable capacitor. In reality, it's not a capacitor. It's a semiconductor diode whose capacitance depends on reverse voltage. You'll see very gaps in tube circuits and filters to set frequency. The schematic symbol looks like a diode that's not accidental. The PN junction of any diode has what's called junction capacitance. If you reverse bias a diode, it stops conducting and turns into an insulator while its anode and cathode become capacitor plates. The higher the reverse voltage, the thicker the junction barrier, and hence 
the smaller the capacitance. So, by changing reverse bias, we can electronically tune capacitance. For what it's worth, any diode does this to some extent, but varicaps are designed to have a large tuning range, 3 to 5 times or more. Varicaps have very low losses and a tiny temperature coefficient, which makes them perfect for RF circuits where capacitance is measured in fractions of picofarads. Here is the typical varicap tuning circuit. LC tank, varicap as part of it, and a variable resistor that sets the bias voltage. Notice the varicap is reverse biased, that's important. C1 isolates DC, so the tank isn't shunted. R1 prevents the pop from loading the tank and messing with resonance. In modern digitally tuned receivers, there are no potentiometers. Instead, the CPU sends binary values to the digital to analog converter, the DAC, and the DAC voltage biases the varicap. Varicap specs Max reverse voltage 32 volts, nominal capacitance at 1 volt 230 to 280 picofarads, tuning ratio 20x between 1 and 30 volts. So, at 30 volts, its capacitance is around 12 picofarads. High power varicaps used in frequency multipliers are called varactors from variable reactants. This is the diac, also known as a two-terminal thyristor, trigger diode, or Shockley diode. If you understand how thyristors work, understanding the diac is easy. A diac has only two terminals, and instead of a gate signal, it turns on when the voltage exceeds a certain threshold, called breakover voltage. Its VA characteristic has an S shape. As we raise voltage, current increases slowly. When voltage hits the threshold, the diac turns on, current rises sharply, and voltage drops. When the voltage falls to the holding voltage, it stops falling, while current continues to increase sharply. That means the diac is latched. Notice that the same voltage can correspond to two different states, conducting and non-conducting. That's called bistable behavior. In English literature, the term diac is common, but technically speaking, a diac is a bidirectional device, two back-to-back -back diacs used in AC. For example, in this thyristor dimmer circuit, the diac DB3 forms the trigger pulse for the triac, a bidirectional thyristor. Though later in the AC half cycle the triac turns on, the dimmer the lamp. C1 charges via R1 and R2 until its voltage exceeds the diac threshold. Then the trigger pulse goes to the triac and turns it on. This repeats every half cycle. Why do we need the diac here? Why not apply the capacitor voltage directly to the triac's gate? Because without the diac, C1 would charge non-linearly through the gate and the trigger timing would be mushy and unreliable. The diac, on the other hand, opens sharply at the exact moment, allowing precise timing. A simple LED flasher can also be made from a diac. C chargers through R and D1 until about 32 volts. The diac fires. C dumps through the LED. LED flashes. Voltage drops. Diac turns off. And the cycle repeats. In CFL lamps, diacs are also used as oscillation starters. Here ST083 plays that pro. Fun fact. There is no single standard schematic symbol for the diac. Sometimes it even resembles the number 4. For the four semiconductor layers. In the 1950s, the diac was among the first silicon devices, because other semiconductors back then were germanium. 
and because of its historical significance, it even has a monument in California. And the last component in today's parade, the tunnel diet. A tunnel diet is a semiconductor device whose VA curve contains a region of negative differential resistance. As we increase voltage, current grows, section A, then suddenly decreases, section B, then increases again, section C. That decreasing region is the tunnel effect. Tunnel diodes were discovered by Liwo Isaki, who won the Nobel Prize in 1973. That's why we also call them Isaki diodes. Tunnel diodes are terrible rectifiers because they leak current heavily under reverse voltage. So they're used where their unique characteristic is needed, mainly in high frequency circuits, preamps, high frequency switches, and oscillators. Under the right conditions, they can work above 10 GHz. Here is a typical tunnel diode oscillator circuit. R1 sets bias so the diode sits right in the negative resistance region. R2 sets current for the tank circuit. When the switch closes, current through the diode rises. Then the diode shifts through regions A, B, C, forming one oscillation cycle. The LC tank determines the resonant frequency and produces a sinusoidal wafer. And that's all for today. If you found this video useful, please like, share and subscribe. And you can support the channel and its woofer by sending over some crypto, Bitcoin or Ether. The links you may find in the description. This was Ramatino. Be good.